Burned Down. Written by Jason Norton. Narrated by Jeff Clement. What began as a wretched weekend for Preston Allstott was turning out most glorious. His elation would have invariably been lost on the casual observer who did not share his passion for botany. But knee-deep in the brackish muck of the Everglades, leeches, gators, and fist-sized mosquitoes aside, he was reborn. Preston had woke on the last day of class, planning to work through spring break, his Friday morning took a turn for the worse when he discovered a pipe in his kitchen had burst. His car would not start, and then he learned Harvard no longer required the talents of two fellow biologists in the upcoming year. With untold semesters to go before he could even hope for the security of tenure, Preston thought his position was threatened. He needed to publish, or at least contribute to some credible research to bolster his resume if he were to have any chance of staying with the university. But he had no idea where to begin. It was all too much. Preston had to get away. He called his contractor, worked out where to leave the key, and taxied to the airport. Five hours later, he was on a red eye to Florida. Preston considered calling his research team but the trip was supposed to be a casual getaway, not an expedition. Janie, he thought. She should have been part of his team, but she'd refused to accompany him on the last leg of his doctoral pursuit, choosing to stay in Ithaca. By sophomore year, Janie told him that she would always be his second most loved carbon-based life form. They still talked once per month by phone, but hadn't been face to face or body to body, in over six years. Ever since, Preston was married to his work, and he made no apologies. Human relationships had always been too difficult. Plants were easy. They lived and died. In the interim, they waged a silent war for survival, doing their damnedest to choke out competitive species for territorial dominance. Emotions were never involved, there was no need for conversation or compromise. Plants were content to be alone. Six years hadn't helped him forget. Preston was still thinking of Janie as his plane taxied the tarmac. Preston took full advantage of the hotel's continental breakfast, then showered and slathered on sunscreen. After grabbing a folder full of ungraded midterms in the complimentary Miami Herald, he headed to the beach. It was spring break, and the college tourists that had bombarded the city still had a few more hours before they would depart, zombie-like, for their hotels, leaving the oceanfront suspiciously devoid of sunbathers. An hour later, Preston had only trudged through three midterms. It was difficult to focus. Peeling himself from his chair, he waded into the blue-green Atlantic. Diving under the waves, Preston made his way past the breakers. He followed the tide to buoy him as he lay backward. Eyes closed, he floated, mentally riffling through rare orchid species. It was a form of yoga he'd first utilized years ago. Cymbidium sinense, indigenous to India, Taiwan, and Thailand, found in cool climates and requires ample light with lower temperatures. Thrives in an ideal humidity between 40 and 60%. Catlia schillerania, Brazil, grows in cool to hot temperatures on cliff faces and in rivers anywhere from sea level to 800 meters above, often used to create hybrids in attempts to breed super orchids. 
Dendrophylax lindeni, first found in Cuba in 1844, discovered in South Florida 50 years later, commonly known as the ghost orchid due to its billowy white appearance. 2,000 known to exist in the state, their location mostly kept secret by researchers and horticulturalists, considered the most sought-after orchid in the world. Preston opened his eyes at the realization, losing the poise of his float posture. South Florida? He was in South Florida. Within 40 minutes, he could be in the heart of Big Cypress Swamp. He couldn't believe he hadn't thought of it sooner. He could find a ghost orchid. Bringing one back would be tantamount to sacrilege, but if he got the chance to study one in the wild, to even see one, it would spark inspiration for his next project and save his position at Harvard. Preston dug his cell phone from his bag. Dialing information, he asked for airboat companies. He stopped the operator at the third listing. The operator connected him directly. Fandango Airboat Tours. Best gator gazing gateway in the glades. The gravelly voice on the other end extolled. Mo speaking. May I help you? Do you have tours going out today? Sure do, Mo replied. Preston waited expectantly. What time? he asked, realizing Mo wasn't volunteering additional information. Time you want to leave? Mo asked, after an audible sip and swallow. Uh, how about around noon? Preston suggested, caught it off guard at the man's nonchalance. He wondered if all the natives were as casual. Nah, noon's no good. Too damn hot. How about, let's say, four? Sun'll be lower, Mo countered. Four it is, Preston agreed. Listen, is there any chance this could be a private tour? Hell, they'll all be private today. Spring breakers don't care about airboating. Ain't no sex or booze in it. He paused. Well, no sex anyway. Unless a couple of them co-eds show up and play their cards right. Preston arrived at Fandango 15 minutes early. There wasn't much to the place. The tiny shack had an attached pavilion that barely covered two picnic tables. An old cash register sat atop a weathered bar. Two t-shirts, one red, one black, hung on coat hangers dangling from the rafters. The sun-bleached shirts proudly displayed the white Fandango logo, an airboat driven by an oversized, bespeckled alligator sunglasses resting on his snout. A graying, rotund man, wearing a trucker's cap with the same logo, emerged from the shack. His name was embroidered on his black polo. Mo. Howdy, friend. You must be my four o'clock. Mr... Uh, uh, doctor, actually, Preston corrected. Dr. Preston Alstott. My apologies, Mo said, extending his hand. M.D.? Professor of Botanical Sciences at Harvard, Preston said, shaking the large man's hand. An Ivy League plant man. Hmm. Funny. I, I suppose so, Preston agreed, surprised he'd never made the same connection. You must be here on business, considering your request for a private ride. Mo surmised. Uh, correct. I'm, uh, I'm hoping to find... A ghost orchid? Mo finished for him. It was quickly becoming apparent that, despite the man's yokel appearance, he was no dummy. I can probably help you with that, but it'll cost a little more. Uh, about we say a hundred. That won't be a problem, Preston assured him, pulling his wallet from his back pocket. Card readers on the fritz, Mo said when he saw Preston thumbing a visa. Oh, sure, Preston fished out the cash. Alrighty then, Mo said, 
pocketing the bills as he headed back inside the shack. He re-emerged with a hefty red and white cooler in his right hand. In his left, he carried a bag of jumbo marshmallows. Okay, Professor. Let's ride. Fifteen minutes later, they were speeding through the swamp. The boat tore through a swarm of mayflies. The insects peppered Preston's face like scattered buckshot. He'd never been so thankful for sunglasses. Sorry about that, Doc. Mo yelled over the sound of the whining propeller. Trying to avoid some brush on the left. Stilted red mangroves threw roots in intricate patterns across the swamp floor. Preston was impressed at how well Mo was dodging the trees. We only need a couple inches of water, but we can still snag anything too stout or dry, Mo called out. The combined speed, gas fumes, and frequent zigzagging weighed on Preston. How much further? He yelled. Half hour, maybe a little more. Your thumb ain't the only thing green right now, Doc. Here, I'll pull over for a sec. Let you get your gut right. Mo killed the throttle. Turning the propeller handle, he guided the boat into a culvert. The fan blades whirred to a stop as the boat drifted slowly. <sighs> Thanks, Preston said, his stomach appreciative. Examining the perimeter, he spied bladder warts, water lilies, and spatter dogs. Preston saw a trickling ripple swirl to the left of the boat. What was that? he asked anxiously. That, Mo said, leaning over the side of the boat, is Big Al. He's a local legend in these parts. Al? As in... Uh, you came by that doctor in honest bag Mo said, opening the bag of marshmallows. Yeah, old Al is about 18 feet worth of gator. Most folks figure he's about 60 years old. Most gators grow to about 11 and check out. He's what a fella like you would probably call an anomaly. Preston craned his neck. He watched Mo, trying to follow the older man's searching eyes. Something so large should have been easier to find. Staring off the rear of the boat, Mo plucked a marshmallow from the bag and held it over the water. You may want to scoop back, Professor. Mo said. Preston inched back as far as his seat allowed. He tensed, feeling sweat drip down his back. The sun may have weakened, but the humidity was as thick as ever. He'd forgotten it while the boat was cutting through the swamp, the headwind drying his skin. Mo clicked his tongue as casually as if he were summoning a house cat. Here, gator, gator, gator. With a violent splash, Big Al broke the water, lunging upward from Moe's outstretched arm. The gator's moss-green head was easily the size of a curbside garbage can, its yellow teeth thick as fingers gnarled like splayed barbed wire. Big Al unhinged his bottom jaw so wide that it looked as if he could swallow Moe whole. At the last possible second, the old boatman dodged backward, letting the marshmallow fly. The gator snatched it from the air and fell back into the water, sending a swell under the boat that nearly capsized it. Preston pitched backward in the vinyl seat, clutching it tightly. Mo cackled. <laughs> you all right, Doc? Man, you should have seen your face. Preston couldn't speak. He really wanted to, so he could ask Mo just what the hell was wrong with him and why he would endanger both their lives for such a stupid stunt. But his lips wouldn't work. Mo offered the bag to Preston. Your turn. Give it a shot. No, no, uh, no, thank you, Preston stammered. His eyes were wide as he frantically scanned the water. <laughs> Suit yourself, Mo said. You don't know what you're missing. Is... Is he coming back? Not unless I offer him another. Please, don't, Preston begged. Mo chuckled. 
I'm sorry, Doc. It's just a gag I use with the tourists. They they get a kick out of it. Of course, uh, you don't usually do it with Al. He can be a little intimidating. Genghis Khan was a little intimidating. Big Al would have made him soil his fur-lined panties, Preston said dryly. Mo grinned, reached into the cooler, and popped the top off a beer, shoving it at Preston. <laughs> have one. It'll calm your nerves. Staying low, Preston took as few steps as possible to accept the offer. Thanks, he said. Don't worry. She ain't gonna tip over, Mo assured him. Tell you what, I'll get us back out onto the main, and we can troll a bit before we pick up speed again. Great. Mo fiddled with buttons on what Preston recognized as the engine. Pulling a ripcord, the fan blades spun to life. He reached for the rudder, gently guiding the boat into the open swamp. Preston sipped his beer. It was bitter. He studied the label. Swamp Ape IPA. Yeah, it's brewed up in Melbourne, Mo said. It's good, Preston lied. Bet your ass it is. Just like everything in Florida. Except the damn Cubans. Preston shot him an uncomfortable glance. No offense, Mo quickly added. None taken. Preston pulled his cell phone from his pocket. Eleven minutes after five. How long until the orchids? He asked. Depends how you're feeling, Mo replied. I'm good. We can pick up speed any time. Relax, Doc. Enjoy the scenery. You ain't paying by the hour, and you're still looking a little green. Preston swatted a mosquito from his neck, wishing he'd stop for repellent. The Spanish were the first to ever map the glades, though they hadn't even seen it, Mo began in full tour guide mode, speaking just loud enough that Preston could hear him over the sound of the engine. They knew there was something between the Gulf and the Atlantic, but they didn't know exactly what. They named it Laguna del Espirito Santo, Lake of the Holy Spirit. Right. I read that in the brochure, Preston said. The primary vegetation here is obviously sawgrass, which has some interesting characteristics. For example, sawgrass leaves will burn. But not the submerged roots, Preston said. It's how the sawgrass survives all the fires caused by lightning strikes. Sharp cookie, Mo said. Preston smiled. That is kind of my area of expertise, he said with an air of pride. How about a little history lesson then? Please, Preston said, less anxious. I'm sure you're familiar with the lost colony of Virginia. Sure. They were the last members of modern-day North Carolina's Roanoke Colony, who disappeared. When other settlers came looking for them, they found all their homes and buildings dismantled. The only clue to their disappearance was the word Croatoan, carved into a nearby tree, Preston said, as if he were lecturing back at Harvard. What happened? Mo asked. Well, there are two theories. Some scholars believe the group was signaling that they were relocating to Croatoan Island, what we now know as Hatteras Island. And the other theory? The colonists were trying to point to a tribe that abducted them. That's highly unlikely, though, Preston said, leaning into the boat as it cut to the right. You think so? How would someone have the wits or the time to carve something like that into a tree during a mass kidnapping? Oh, you'd be surprised what fear can do, Mo said, finishing his beer. What if I told you we had our own little lost colony right here in the glades? I didn't realize there were colonists here. Not colonists, per se. Indians. I mean... Native Americans. Go on, Preston said, setting his empty swamp ape bottle in the bottom of the boat. Mo tossed him another. Mo cleared his throat. <clears throat> Initially, there were two major tribes in the glades, 
the Calusa and the Tequesta. The Calusa were the big boys. Several thousand of them lived here, but they suffered attacks from an invading Yamasi tribe from the north. Less than a thousand survived. Most fled with the Spanish explorers who relocated them to Cuba. But when disease started killing them off, they moved to the Keys. The Tequesta were supposedly a peaceful bunch, but the Spanish were scared shitless. Said that Tequesta ambushed their sailors who ran aground in the glades and would torture them to death. Half a decade later, Spanish priests tried to build missions along the coast, figuring they might be able to convert them. Turns out another invading tribe, the Yuchi, took care of that problem instead. Between them and the Seminoles, the Tequesta were nearly wiped out. Around 1770, a British historian found most of their villages leveled. Legend has it that the final 30 surviving Tequesta were deported to Havana. Most folks around here don't believe that, though. So what do they think happened? Preston asked between swallows. Well, nobody really knows, but this flower you're looking for? The old timers around here swear those dead Indian spirits are what gives those things life. So you're saying the Tequesta put the ghost in the ghost orchid? Preston said, feebly suppressing a grin. I'm just telling you what folks believe. That's why they say those orchids are so rare, so special. They think the Tequesta spirits inhabit the orchids and protect them. Sort of the last piece of their property they don't want to lose, Mo explained. Well, I've heard some interesting theories on plant development, but that's a new one to me. Mo revved the throttle gently and motioned for Preston to steady himself. All I know is that you don't get to be old by being stupid. As the time passed, the beer proved to be a double-edged sword. It undoubtedly helped make the trip more enjoyable, but it seemed to have stolen Moe's recollection of the orchid's location. Preston cut himself off at three. He wanted to be lucid when, if, they found the orchids. He'd lost count of how many Moe had finished, or how many times he'd followed dead ends. Still, his control of the airboat seemed unfazed. Preston took out his cell phone to check the time, but the battery was dead. The last thing he'd seen on it was a notification of a voicemail from his contractor. He'd simply replied, Fix it, in text. He estimated that it was close to 8 o'clock. The sun had set about a half hour earlier and twilight streaked the sky. How much longer? I'm pretty sure they're just up around that bend there. Preston followed Moe's gesture, spying the outline of a tiny outcropping. Yep, won't be long now. Preston restrained his anticipation. Though Mo had been good company, his navigational track record had proven less than stellar. The time hadn't been a total waste. Talking about the Everglades' history was the lengthiest conversation he'd had with anyone, not even talks with Janie. And there she was again, right where he left her, waiting in the back of his mind. Mo idled the boat into the cove. We're here, he gestured toward the sawgrass before them. May I present the Florida Ghost Orchid? Hundreds of ghost orchids, as white as they were in every picture Preston had seen, danced in the gently lapping water. He was moved to tears. You okay, Professor? My god, there's so many. There are only supposed to be 2,000 in the state, Preston said, his attention unwavering. Well, that may have been all they've found, but that don't mean that's all there is. When you've been running the glades as long as I have, you learn a few secrets. Mo eased the boat closer, allowing Preston a better look. There's enough ground there to walk right out and touch one. He pointed to the 20 feet of mud-covered bank in front of the boat. Seriously? Aren't there gators out there? 
Preston asked, captivated by the opportunity. Hell, Doc, there's gators everywhere around here. Just don't stay too long. I'll keep the light on and holler if I see anything. Preston tossed his wallet and phone in the boat, then eased his way out onto the marshy beach. He swapped his vision between the orchids and the watery slop that came up to his knees, in case Big Al, or one of his cousins, chose to make an appearance. But there, that close, he was more excited than afraid. He reached out and cradled an orchid. Its petals, sepals, and lobes all fluttered in perfect unison. Its fluted stigma stood proud, displaying elegance amongst strength. My God, Preston repeated, laughing joyously. <laughs> Mo, you've got to come see this up close. This is unbelievable. No thanks, Mo said. I'll pass. Preston heard the boat's motor start back up, but he couldn't take his eyes off the orchids. All right, Doc. It's been real. Second thought, stay a while. I think you'll like it here. Mo called out as he opened the engine full bore. Preston turned. The shrill hum and sudden gust of the fan disrupted his stupor. He lunged after the reversing boat, taking two steps, and then plummeted face first into the waist high water. Panic and confusion overtook him. He tried to swim after Mo, but was tossed aside by the boat's churning wake. Preston screamed begging Mo to return until he lost sight of the spotlight. <sighs> Terrified and alone in the blackness, he slid back through the ooze to the company of the orchids. Scratching blindly in the muck, Preston scrambled as high on the bank as possible to escape the reach of any gators. He found the root of a mangrove and held on for dear life trying to get his feet on land. A guttural murmur came from the left. He froze and listened. A moment later, it warbled again, louder. An echo answered from behind him, followed by another. Within seconds, terrifying sounds surrounded him. Preston tried to run, but tumbled back into the marsh. He stayed under for as long as he could, hoping the noise would be gone when he surfaced. For a moment, the noises sounded like a language, an ancient, lost language unfamiliar to Preston. He rose from the water, working towards the shore, then stopped dead in his tracks. The glow of tiny red dots danced in the darkness. They bounced within yards of him before disappearing. Suddenly, the small pair of lights came back, joined by other pairs. Eyes, Preston thought. He stood, water seeping into his very core. Dozens of different colored eyes stared at him, glowing yellow, orange, and red. Something brushed past his legs, snapping him back into reality. He thrashed in the water, trying to find the mangrove to back against. Silence and stillness returned. All the eyes disappeared. Preston clambered up onto the roots of the tree. He had imagined it all. It, it, it must have been some type of a fish against his leg and fireflies in the trees. Most stories had gotten the better of him but it wouldn't get the best. He was a man of science, after all. Suddenly, dozens of moss-covered hands reached up, took hold, and pulled Preston beneath the liquid black. He thrashed, kicking and screaming, his bubbling voice sounding much like those of his now screaming tormentors. Reds, Oranges and yellows flashed around him as he was pulled into the bowels of the swamp, mud and water filling his nose, eyes, and lungs. Preston ceased struggling as the strong hands gently guided him deeper into the mud. When he opened his eyes, 
He could see clearly. Everything was in shades of yellow. Vines snaked around him, piercing his flesh in excruciating precision. Slimy vegetation slithered down his throat, nesting his organs in floral incubators. Roots slowly replaced his bones. Preston heard the process in his mind, the sentient screams of his dying cells and the triumphant battle cries of the new organisms conquering his body. Then came the voices of his brothers, warm and inviting as they began to hoist him from the murk. He finally understood them all. Still, he tried holding on. He tried salvaging what was left of himself, of Preston. Why resist, he wondered. All his fears were fading. This was everything he had ever wanted. Preston wasn't alone anymore. But then he thought of Jenny. Jamie. Janet. Jan. What was it again? <laughs>